So this quick video is to explain how to do some analysis with your Beer's Law experiment. This is the handout that you were given. You should have selected one of the three salts on the left. If you were using the green solution, that was the nickel uh, solution. If you were using something that looked purpley pink, that was a cobalt solution. And if you were using something that looked blue, that was the copper sulfate solution. You should have recorded on the right, on the graph, the absorption spectrum for your salt. So here I'm using the copper sulfate solution, and this is what its absorption spectrum pretty much looks like. All right, so on that absorption spectrum, the highest absorbance value here is around 700 nanometers. So I labeled that as my lambda max value around 700 nanometers, meaning that's the wavelength of visible light that the solution absorbs best. Now we're going to be using Beer's Law in this experiment. That's the title of the graph. Beer's law is mathematically this equation here, A equals EBC. The little E there is actually the Greek letter epsilon, and it's called the molar absorptivity of the ion in our solution that's causing the color. So it's the molar absorptivity of copper or of cobalt or of nickel that are in our three solutions. The letter B is the length of the path of light. So we were using those little square cuvettes. We were filling those cuvettes, those plastic cuvettes, with our solutions. Those cuvettes had a, a length of one centimeter. So the diameter or the side length of the square cuvette was exactly 1.00 centimeters. So for us, the value of B in this equation is one centimeter or just one. The letter C in that equation stands for the concentration of the solution. We are going to prepare five different concentrations. And then the capital A at the beginning is referred to as the absorbance. Okay, the absorbance. So it's the amount of light absorbed by the solution at the wavelength that we're using. So in the lab, since B is equal to 1 in this experiment, B is the length of the, the distance the light travels, A equals EBC can simplify to the equation A equals EC. Because the value for B was a 1, it can just be ignored. A equals EC looks like Y equals MX. They have the same format algebraically. And you might recognize y equals mx is a straight line when you graph it. So since a equals ec looks like y equals mx, a graph of absorbance on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis, should produce a straight line. And the slope of that line should give me the molar absorptivity. So the slope, the symbol for slope in a math class is the letter m, it will equal the molar absorptivity value, that, that Greek letter epsilon. So we're going to prepare five different solutions of different concentrations. So you'll have five different concentrations. You'll measure their absorbance values, and then we're going to prepare this graph, and it should come out as a linear graph. All right, so on the back side of your handout, we've already done a calculation where we calculated how many grams of salt that we would need to make 50 milliliters, but remember this, of 0.4 molar solution. The solution that you prepared had a concentration of 0 0.400 molarity. That was the solution you prepared. Since you know what its concentration is, we refer to that as a stock solution. The stock solution is the solution where you know its concentration. So on the side of your table, for table one, you can indicate, remind yourself, that the stock solution's concentration was 0 0.400 molarity. Now in the experiment, I asked students to take five test tubes. This is on the second day of the experiment. And you put anywhere from one to 10 milliliters 
of your copper or cobalt or your nickel stock solution into each test tube. Your numbers may not be the same as these. They may be a bit different, but this is what many people chose to do. They put two milliliters in the first test tube. They put four in the second. You may have used different numbers. So that's okay. okay. So don't just copy these. You have to use your numbers. And the last test tube, they put 10 milliliters of the stock solution. Then they added distilled water and they added enough water to make a total of 10 milliliters in each test tube. So if they had two mils of the stock solution, they added eight mils of the distilled water. And then if they had four mils, they added six mils, they're making 10 mils total in each test tube. So then there'd be four mils, six plus four is 10, and then there'd be two mils, eight plus two is 10, the last test tube already had 10 milliliters, so they would have put zero mils in the last test tube of distilled water. So when you're adding water to your stock solution, you're diluting it, right? So dilution, you might remember grade 11 chemistry, there's a formula for performing dilution calculations. That formula you might want to write on the side margin for dilution, we're going to use this equation a lot this year, so make sure you know it. C1V1 equals C2V2. The concentration of the original stock solution, which was 0.4 molarity, times the volume of that solution you're using, that's C1 and V1, will equal the concentration of the diluted solution, that's C2, times the volume of the diluted solution, and that's V2. So C1 was the starting concentration of stock solution. V1 is the volume of stock solution you used. C2 is the concentration of the diluted solution, and V2 is the volume of the diluted solution. So C1, V1 equals C2, V2. If you rearrange it, you can say C2, the concentration of our diluted solutions, is C1V1 divided by V2. So remember, V2 is the volume of the diluted solution. Looking back up at our table for table one, in each of the five test tubes, the total volume of diluted solution was the same. It was 10 milliliters every time. So in every one of those test tubes, V2 is going to be 10 milliliters. V1 is the volume of the stock solution that you used to make those solutions. So V1 in the first, situ in the first test tube, V1 would be 2 milliliters. That's how much of the stock solution you used. In test tube 2, V1 is 4 milliliters. That's how much you used, right? So now we know V2 is the total volume, and it's always the same. It's 10 milliliters every time. V1 is changing in each test tube. And C1, well, that was the concentration of the stock solution. And stock solution was 0 0.400 molarity, so that's the same in every test tube. So now you can calculate the concentration of your salt your cobalt salt, your nickel salt, your, your um, what was the third one, your copper salt in each test tube. I'll do it here with one example, and then you can do it yourself with your numbers. So for me, in test tube number one, it's going to be a different calculation each time, my C2 would be C1, the original concentration, 0.4 molarity, times V1, I used, look up at table one, I used two milliliters of the stock solution, so times 2.00, divided by the total volume, which was 10 milliliters, okay? So 0.4 molarity times two milliliters divided by 10 milliliters. If I do that on my calculator, I get 0 0.0800 molarity. That's the concentration of the, for me, the copper solution in my first test tube. I'm going to do the same kind of calculation for test tubes 
two, three, four, and five. Okay, so you will know five concentrations. In the lab, you measured the absorbance values of the five solutions. I don't know what your absor absorbance values were. I'm going to just make up a number. So suppose my first absorbance value was 0 0.127, right? Absorbance values don't have any units. So that was my absorbance from the computer in the lab. You'll have a different absorbance for each of your solutions. Now you have five concentrations and you have five absorbance values. You can take a piece of graph paper and you can prepare this graph. You can put on the x-axis of your graph concentration of your salt. For me, it would be concentration of copper sulfate and the units would be molarity. My absorbance values go on the y-axis. And now I'm going to plot my data. So I'm going to plot, whoops, that, I shouldn't have erased that. I'm going to plot the five points that were from that data table down here. So these five points, concentration and absorbance, concentration and absorbance for test tube two, concentration and absorbance for test tube three, all the way to the fifth test tube, and if I've done a good job, when I plot those five points, I should get pretty much a straight line. So I'm going to take a ruler, and once I've plotted them, and I'm going to draw a, a line that goes right through the data using a ruler, okay? Let me redo my line. So make sure you use a ruler, not just sketching it by hand. You should get a perfectly straight line going through your data. Now it's possible if you weren't the best pipetter that your points maybe aren't perfect. So your points may not be perfectly linear. Maybe you have points that look something like that. Okay, there's your five points. So what you'll do is you'll take a ruler and you'll draw a straight line through the middle of most of your points. So maybe there's a point above, maybe there's a point below. That's called a line of best fit. Okay, so that's the line you would draw if your points were not perfectly linear. Now, the last thing to do is to go to the unknown. Look at table two. You recorded an absorbance value for the unknown. Maybe it's absorbance. I'm just making this number up. Maybe it was 0 0.271, okay? You'll have your own absorbance value. So now you go to your graph. You've done this graph on a piece of graph paper. You're not doing this on loose leaf or something. You're doing it on a large piece of graph paper. If your absorbance was 0 0.271, then you find that number on the y-axis. So maybe, maybe this is 0.1, this is 0.2. Maybe I'm just making these numbers up. Maybe that's 0.3. So 0.271 would be around here. So I take my ruler and I draw a line, a straight line going straight across till it hits the, the line on my graph, just like that. And then I go straight down and I hit the x-axis. I look to see what number is that on the x-axis. That number is the concentration. Remember square brackets means concentration. That's the concentration of my unknown. And that's the purpose of the experiment, to find the concentration of that unknown solution. So after you get your graph, take the absorbance value that you measured for the unknown. I want to see this on your graph. Draw a line straight over till it hits the line that you had drawn earlier. Then go straight down to the x-axis and see what number that is. And you'll say here, the unknown concentration is approximately, and you'll read that number, this much molarity. That's the purpose of the experiment, to find the concentration of the unknown solution. Okay? So that's how I want you to analyze your data. So look at the end of the of the sheet here. I think I've done, whoops, I think I've done everything that's there. Where it says find the equation of the line of best fit. We, we won't do that, so don't worry about the line of best fit. We'll just do as I've shown. We'll draw a line with our ruler, and we'll use that line 
to find the concentration of the unknown. All right, so good luck analyzing your data for Beer's Law. If you have questions, post a question publicly on Google Classroom in response to this post so everybody can see the question and see my answer.